Welcome back to Myth and Mission. I'm very excited today to dive into some flood accounts. So I hope you're ready to get soaked in the Bible. Okay, come on, man. You probably know this, but there are other flood accounts in the ancient world. And what I want to do today is look at how different they are because the Bible, when you compare it to uh, the view of the flood of Israel's neighbors, it has a very different view of God. And I think it's important for us to see. And when we think about our default posture, like what is God like? What comes to mind? Let's look at these flood accounts as a springboard for that concept. There's a wonderful scholar named John Curid who does a lot of work with ancient Near Eastern comparatives. And he has a list of some of these accounts that maybe some of you have heard, maybe some of them you haven't. There's the Epic of Gilgamesh. We're going to be looking at that today. There's the Atrahasis Epic, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which has a flood account in it. And there's Beresauce. Beresauce? Beres? Bear sauce? Get you some of that bear sauce! Yeah! I had to look at my pronunciation on that one. What are these flood accounts like? Well, there's some contours to these flood accounts that are generic, and there's some variation as well. But generally speaking, there's a problem. The deity or deities, uh, depending on which account you're reading, they send a flood to destroy the earth, essentially. And somebody either has found out or that uh, deity has told that person that they, that they need to to build a boat or whatever, and there's there's some some of the people are in a boat, I maybe mean, they've got some animals with them, and then the boat lands, the waters recede, and there's usually some sort of moment of worship uh, in, in this time and culture that's a sacrifice. So these are component parts that are pretty common in all of these stories, but the way they tell these stories is drastically different. So I want to look at one, given that that's the general contour of a flood account. I want to slide into two different scenes here at the Epic of Gilgamesh. First, after the deities have released the flood, and second, when that moment of, of, of worship happens and there's a sacrifice made, let's look at how they respond to that. It's going to give us some insights about what the ancient Babylonians thought about their gods. So let's go. The gods were frightened by the deluge, and shrinking back, they ascended to the heaven of Anu. The gods cowered like dogs, crouched against the outer wall, the gods, all humbled, sit and weep. Wow. Okay, do you hear that? So they, they, they did the flood thing, and then they're afraid of the flood, and they actually flee up, crawl up uh, like dogs up a wall. <laughs> Anybody? It's a little different from the Bible's view. Gilgamesh gets off the boat, offers a sacrifice, and here's their response. The gods smelled the savor. The gods smelled the sweet savor. The gods gathered like flies over the sacrifices. You see, the gods ate the sacrifices of humanity. And so while the flood was happening, no one was feeding them. And the sacrifice that Gilgamesh makes, like they, they're just, they're ravenous. They're hungry that nobody's fed them. So they're, 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 they're just going at it like flies. Does anybody think this is a little weird? So this flood account is really showing you a different view of what a deity is like. And this is how contrastive the Bible would have been in its own cultural context, just mind-blowingly contrastive. So uh, another ancient Near Eastern scholar, Christopher Hayes, he helps us dive into this and diagnose it a little bit. Let's read his stuff on this. In Gilgamesh, no motivation is given for the flood. Let that sink in for a second. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the, the gods actually aren't listed as having a reason for the flood. As we'll see, the Bible's all about that. But there is some other accounts. We'll, we'll continue here. In Atrahasis and other versions, the reason given is excessive noise by humans, but it is not a moral reason. Indeed, it is not a moral reason. The way it's described in Atrahasis is the, 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 the gods were losing sleep because humans were too noisy. That's a fickle reason to just throw the world into a massive global flood, don't you think? Anybody not respect these deities very much? They, they're kind of throwing a tantrum here. Part of the point of the Mesopotamian stories is to portray of humanity as subject to the whims of sometimes destructive and inscrutable gods. Indeed, they are about their own whims. There is no moral reason here for the flood. Does, is anybody bothered by that? Like, it's not like, well, humanity did this terrible thing. It's like, they're a little too noisy. I'm gonna destroy them. I'm gonna destroy them. And not even that, I'm going to destroy them with water I can't even control. And you know what, I'm, I'm going to regret it because they didn't feed me while they were drowning. It, this is a low view of a deity. Uh, and, and, and the Mesopotamian authors are doing that on purpose. This is how they view their gods. This is how they make sense of disaster. This is how they make sense of the purposes around them. 
It must be the fickle gods throwing tantrums that they can't really control. Is anybody bothered by that? Is that your view of God? Just pause for a second. Do you have any similarities to that perspective? Do you think God's fickle? Do you think God's in control? Do you think God cares about what happens to people? Or is God just motivated by his own self-interest? These are questions we can ask ourselves if we have any similarities to these Babylonian authors. Well, we could summarize their view of the gods like this. The gods aren't really in control and suck. Yeah, they really do suck. They're like throwing tantrums. They can't even control. They don't really care. Is that your view of God? I hope not. Let's take a look at the Bible's view of things and we'll just see how remarkably different it is. So we're going to dip into different moments in the story. The flood account in the Bible takes place from Genesis chapter 6 through 9. And we're just going to hit some of these key points in the narrative and see how the Bible deals with the question of what is God like? All right, are you ready? This is Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. If you've paid attention to the Genesis narrative thus far, there's this turn in Genesis chapter 3, and it says, now the serpent, and the, the narrative kind of shifts, and there's this looming figure that's going to turn things into a mess. And the opposite happens here in Genesis chapter 6. Now Noah. Now, what I want to observe here is that, yes, the pain of God's heart is highlighted here, that it is, he's heartbroken. It's not an arbitrary reason that the flood happens. It's because of the wickedness, the, the absolute corruption of his cosmos that the, that the human heart has caused. And he decides to take action. He is just. He's not going to leave this wickedness and corruption forever. But he is responsive. And he sees each and every human being, and he does not ignore even one shred of faith, one, one inclination towards him. And thus, he sees Noah. And so what we see here is a God who is responsive to humanity. And as we'll see, humanity is responsive to God in this account. This is 7-1. The Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. As you know, Noah has this really detailed instruction about what to build and how to gather different animals and uh, what, what, what kind of thing to expect. And he obeys it to a T. You see, they're in a responsive relationship to one another. It's not what we read in Gilgamesh where there's this arbitrary, you know, flood. And, and actually, I think Gilgamesh finds out secretively that, that this is going to happen. God is actually making his intent known because he's in a responsive relationship with humanity. So after the flood subsides, just as God said it would happen, and God is in control that whole time, and it was for a certain amount of time that God set, and then the flood, you know, recited. And so we pick up with Noah getting off the boat. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his son's wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground, and all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark one after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. So do you see that Noah offers this sacrifice? There's worship to God. God isn't ravenously going to eat the sacrifices. He smells the aroma that he has in common with the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, but his response is that of bestowing uh, this, this promise. Uh, not you know, diving in like he hasn't eaten. So you have a very different picture of God in this account. Let's keep going. 9-1. 
Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth. So we see the the continuance of the original promise. If you've paid attention in the book of Genesis so far, chapter 1, you have this be fruitful, increase in number. He's made uh, humanity in his image and likeness, and and they're going to fill the earth with his glory. The the, the same intent that God had to to share his life and his character, his image with a a family, with a priestly family that would represent him, the cultural man that they grow and, and, and multiply and, and, and create and garden the earth. God's continuing that project. It's a highly relational project. And, and so the, the aftermath of the flood is, is not like, yeah, don't do that again. It's, I'm, I'm continuing this. I, 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 I promise myself to you. I, I'm giving a covenant to you is what God is saying. God is interested primarily in a relationship between himself and humanity. And that's what we see the, the, the thread turn to. The, the cause and, and, the, the, and the, the end of the story are related to God's relationship with humanity. It's not arbitrary. It's not just because he's annoyed with their noise. It is because he wants the fullest kind of relationship with humanity possible. And it's a covenant one, and that's what he returns to here. Let's keep reading. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. And God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I will establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So do you guys see God's intent? Do you see his character? He is not doing this for some silly reason about noise. He is He's doing this because of the relationship between him and humanity and, and his heartbreak, and he wants to renew the earth. And and he wants to preserve uh, this, this man who is responsive to God. He wants to, co- to continue with that. Those that are in relationship with God, that are responding to him, he wants them t- to thrive. And so this deluge, this flood that, that, that he sends uh, with warning, it, it, he's completely in control of it. He doesn't cower back like dogs. And the sacrifice that Noah makes, it, it's a pleasing aroma. God is responding uh, and, and is pleased in, in Noah's obedience and is responsive to him in covenant relationship. That's his aim. His aim is relationship. So if we were to take a look back and to kind of summarize the theology of the flood account, what kind of picture of God do we have? Here's what we might say. God is just, sovereign, and in covenant relationship with humanity. And so we don't want to just stop there. The difference between the old Babylonian myth, whether or not we hold any of those like really terrible ideas about God and and, and contrast it with the Bible's rich picture of God and who he is and what he's about. That's that's good. This is a wonderful exercise to show how rich and amazing and unique the Bible is and really encouraging. Uh, Wow, what a beautiful God he is. That's amazing. But we don't want to stop there because Babylonian myth isn't the prime shaper of thought in our context. There are other myths, if you will. And let's dive into this one. It claims to be an unbiased one, a scientific one. Uh, But let's back out just away from the flood account and maybe look at the framework that the flood account could fit in neatly in, in modern day secular thought. We might call this the Big Bang Theory. You've heard of this. Let me be clear. I do not want to demonize a relationship between science and faith. That was a really big crisis for me when I was a teenager. No one gave me a framework to understand that they were they could dialogue together, that they they could they were answering different questions in different processes. But nobody helped me to dialogue, so it was either demonize one or the other. Either the science is real and the Bible is fake, or the Bible is real and science is fake. That was the only options I was presented, at least implicitly, in the context I was in growing up. I don't think that's very helpful. I really think there is a robust and comprehensive way to dialogue with these things. I think there's a, a way to realize that they're answering different questions with different processes. They're different genres of literature uh, and, and, and thus bound to, to different sets of presuppositions and concerns. So, you know, for example, in the Genesis creation account, we're going to get to this in a later episode. 
we we have this idea that the, the earth was created in seven days and and the meaning and the the, 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 the elevated prose it's like this poetic storytelling those are all genre clues to help us understand what the key concerns of the scriptures are uh, the, the biblical authors are more concerned showing a relationship between God and the creation uh, that is orderly that is that is unilaterally God's intent expressed through his word so don't let me lose you in the weeds here what I'm about to do by critiquing the Big Bang is not an attempt to dissuade you from studying and learning deep insight and uh, from, from science. Ultimately, God created the world, so the things that we observe, though we're corrupt in our, in, our, in our faculties because of sin, does not mean that we can't learn deep things from attending well to, to science and creation and, and, and those processes. So what I am saying is that if you allow this scientific exploration to shape all of your views of God, that, that the presupposition of, say, a Big Bang-like theory is that there is absolutely no divine intent. There's no deity that's shaping any of reality, and it must be explained with the concepts of physics and what the observable universe, that there's nothing spiritual at all happening. That's what I want to sink into. That, that, that's actually a common predisposition of people, and, and, and if, if that's our, our pool of, of myth to, to draw a sense of who God is or isn't, you're going to find that wanting. Let's read a little bit from uh, a website that describes a little bit of the Big Bang. Right, here we go. The Big Bang Theory. This all began roughly 13.8 billion years ago and thus is considered to be the age of the universe through the testing of theoretical principles, experiments involving particle accelerators and high energy states and astronomical studies that have observed the deep universe, scientists have constructed a timeline of events that began with the Big Bang and has led to the current state of cosmic evolution. In other words, uh, something like the flood account that gives us a big insight into what people thought or think God is like. The Big Bang is an even broader and non-specific story that gives us a sense of if we reduce any sense of, of, of a deity, of God, as part of the picture of creation, then what we're left with is this idea, that the, the universe just kind of happened. It's this cosmic state of, of evolution started by a Big Bang. Interestingly enough, from what I understand, the Big Bang Theory actually started as the quote-unquote creation point theory which was developed by a Vatican astronomer and was almost endorsed by the Catholic Church. In other words, this guy thought what he was saying was what we could see is that the Earth did have a moment in which it was created. So that's one way to reframe this whole thing, by the way. Check out this guy. Yeah, Google this dude. But what I'm getting at is if science is the answer to the reasons of our existence, then it's going to leave you wanting because the architect of all of this is what? There's an absence. There's no purpose. Nobody did anything on purpose. This was a, um, an inevit inevitability of physics. This happened. There's, there's nobody designing it. There's nobody calling it out. So, so then, then if you're to understand who you are uh, in light of that view of God, you, you're just a glorious accident. And meaning and purpose is something that you're going to have to define for yourself. That's the answer that the Big Bang would give of something like what's in place of a deity. Maybe we could summarize the theology if we limit it ourselves entirely to the idea uh, espoused by science that there's no creator. This might be our view of God. The universe is indifferent. So <laughs> kind of has a more in common with the Epic of Gilgamesh than you might imagine because those gods didn't really care about humanity. They were just doing their own their own purposes that were fickle and fleeting. And in a similar fashion, the Big Bang would leave you with this sense that, what's the point of all of this? Let me try to summarize this. The myths that are available to us that shape our understanding, our imagination, our idea of, of our creator and who God is, we have something like the Epic of Gilgamesh that, you know, I think God might just be fickle or detached or not even all that powerful or you might have this idea that well there really is no creator there is no divine will there is no big picture intent i'm just an accident and there, there's really no answer for any of this and if i'm gonna have meaning in anything it's i'm gonna have to come up with it myself
and it's all relative. And in the middle of that, the Bible cuts through those foggy, messy views of who God might be. And the Bible, as God's self-revelation, how he wants to be revealed is saying, I'm on purpose. And one of my purposes is to have a relationship with you. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm here for. That's what I want you to know is that I want a relationship with you. It turns my heart inside out to be out of relationship with you. And I have even gone to the point of becoming human and dying on a cross to reconcile with you. That is the picture of God. We get these little insights from these flood accounts and, and, and you know, the Big Bang isn't directly a flood account, but it's kind of a bucket of a network of thoughts that maybe we, we could dive in and, and look at what, what's going on here. These myths, these way of seeing ourselves as part of a story shape us and they shape our view of God and they shape our view of ourselves. And we need to realize this. The Bible is an invitation to see God in such a beautiful way. How could we not respond? And so I hope this view of God sticks out to you, that you realize that it's fresh then, it's fresh today, and it's important, timely. And it's, it's part of our mission to show the world through the Bible, through it lived, living as a part of the Bible's story, that this is what God is like. God does things for a purpose, a relationship with humanity. And so let the other views of God fall to the wayside and let God, as he reveals himself, wash over our hearts, our imagination. Let us be shaped by the story of scripture and let us proclaim that truth with our lives, with our words, our deeds. This is our mission to make known who God is. Do you accept this mission? Are you not compelled by the amazing story of the Bible in its own context and in ours? It stands above and cuts through and shows us the light. God is beautiful. May we live in response to him. So let the, all the bad ideas about God wash away in a flood of our own as God shows us what he's really like.